Hello, I'm Ben Jones. I'm here at Hattons today to talk about DCC and how it relates to the new double O gauge class 66 that Hattons are producing. I'm with Mick Bryan, who's a long-standing modern image uh, modeler and DCC user. Hello, Mick. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. Good to meet you. Can you tell us a little bit about this class 66 and what it offers in terms of uh, DCC functions, particularly starting with the lights? Well, DCC uh, has the ability to control lights, depending on which decoder is fitted into it. Uh, will, will depend how many lights you can operate at one time. But what happens have gone here is a loco that will work on four functions, which is the basic decoder, but then we'll have switches that you can do day lighting, headlights, uh, night lights, etc. Then when you fit the sixth function and then the sound decoders, it will give you far more functionality with the lights. So it's uh, very much a, a lot of play value to it, and there's and been a lot of thought gone into it. Right, and you can tailor those uh, functions to your own requirements, can you? Of course, yes. There will be some switches inside that means you can set the set it so you can turn the tail lights off. So if you're not hauling a train, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, hauling a train, um, with four functions, but then when you're on six functions and ten functions, you can turn those lights on and off with your keypad. So okay, very easy to do. Yeah. So will you be able to make use of all those ten functions then with? being more specific about this local. You can use when the sound function decoder is fitted, yes, because yeah. that is the one with the multi-functions on it. But as I say, for the, the simple four function and six function decoders, and even when it's used on normal DC, uh, as I say, Hattons have designed in uh, switches that the taillights can be turned off easily as well. So quite a very flexible local, probably the most flexible local in terms of DCC lighting so far. Okay, and can you tailor things like the brightness of the lights and things like that? It can be done with DCC, yes. Um, there is a setting where you can alter the uh, brightness. I can't remember the exact CV number, um, but it is in there, so you can turn them down a little bit. You can't turn them down individually, but right. you can turn them down as a group if okay. you need to. Okay. Is there anything anything else we haven't talked about with regard to lighting functions that's specific to this local, to the Class 66? Well, it's, got, it's fitted with marker lights, a day headlight, a night headlight, and tail lights. Mm -hmm. Now, some locals in the past have, have had the ability to switch a couple of these out, but this has the ability to switch them all on or off, depending on which decoder is fitted. Okay, and just you can even go to yard mode with no headlights on at all. Okay, so just to explain the, the difference between the day and night settings, what, uh, what does that mean? On the modern stock these days, there's a bright headlight on one side, bright headlight on the other, and they are generally used um, as a daylight and a night light as well. It's more to um, not blind drivers coming the other way. There are other reasons why they do actually have the two headlights on the front, but uh, we'll go into that all the time. Being more specific about the Hattons Class 66, are there any other functions that uh, that it has with regard to things like cab lights, tail lights, um, that we might not have seen before? Well certainly on the multifunction decoder, uh, the, the sound version will have switchable cab lights, it will have yard mode so you can just put the mark lights on at either end, it will have parking as well so just red lights on at both ends, um, train mode where red lights are off when you're hauling a train. So yeah, quite flexible, very flexible in use. So um, anything that's on the real thing you can you can do with Pretty this? Pretty much, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then more generally about uh, decoders, what other functions do, uh, do modern decoders of, of this sort offer? A lot of decoders nowadays have the ability to other, have other light settings such as flicker, flashing tail lights, firebox lights. Um, there's even decoders now with fluorescent light effects. So when you turn them on, they will flicker like a typical fluorescent light. Okay. So, yeah, the decoder world is developing quite rapidly when it comes to lighting functions, yes. Right, and where else could it go, do you think? What else, what else, what sort of other things do you think we could expect to see in the future? Or that these decoders might be able to handle? It does depend on how much, um, how many outputs there are on them. Uh, there is a limitation, the decoder is only so large. Uh, but you put more decoder, you put another decoder on and put all these functions in it. You could have, I don't know, uh, you could have engine room lighting, uh, modern locals nowadays, I think the Class 70 has got external lights on it that light up the footsteps. Right. Uh, there's even engine room lights that are visible on a Class 70. So, get a decoder with enough function outputs, you can do whatever you want. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the beauties of DCC is that you've got all this potential to um, create a local that's just like just like the real thing. Of course, yeah. I mean, the the one really good thing about DCC is power is on all the time. Yeah. You've got that control. You've got that power lights on all the time and that's what brought me into DCC and the, the modern image uh, scene mm -hmm. with everything being well lit up mm -hmm. so lots of functions lots of lights lots of play value that's that's what uh, great is a great thing for me as well okay so we've had a look at lights and what modern decoders can do with DCC on uh, lighting functions let's talk about other aspects now uh, starting with motor control 
Mode control on a decoder. A lot of people fit a DCC decoder, they will simply change the address. They'll give it the number they want to give it and away they go. They'll use the lights, they'll use the sound, that's it. But what can be done with the locomotives is you can set CVs, configuration variables, are quite easy to do, done on most handsets without any problem whatsoever. And you can change the acceleration, deceleration rates, for example. So you represent, is it a heavy freight loco? Is it a light engine? So quite easy to do. Uh, there are lots of tutorials out there. Doesn't take much playing around. And again, it brings more life to the loco. It act, starts to act like the real thing. Is it, in terms of uh, once you've made those settings, do you need to drive it like you would a, a real local? Or oh yes, of course. If you've got the uh, inertia set quite high, so if you've got a high deceleration rate, you could begin to slow it down and it might not slow down for a few metres, such as a heavy freight would do. Obviously, that's a few thousand metres, obviously. Um, so you've got to be careful how you're driving it, but you say it does make it much more realistic. You can also set the the speeds of the locals as well. So for example, if you want to double head locals, it's not difficult to set the top speed to match. So, you, so Okay, so you can run. set a maximum speed? Yes, absolutely, right. same again. So you could say set the class 66 to a representative 75 miles an hour, whereas your high speed train is gonna be doing a scale 125 miles per hour. Yes, not difficult to do at all. Okay, and what about, obviously a lot of modelers um, want to run very slowly when in, in on diesel depots or in yards and things like that, or when they're shunting. Um, does it give you finer motor control so that you can get right down to very slow, uh, very slow movement? One big advantage of DCC, the power is on the track all the time. So you're not going to get that little bit of stalling that you get with sometimes with DC because that's only a run at a few volts, whereas DCC is running at 15, 16, 17 volts typically. So the power is on all the time. So you're getting that power pickup, the decoder reads that and passes on that to the motor. So yes, you can get some very good fine control. As long as you keep your track clean. As long as you keep your track clean, keep your wheels clean. Yep. And one thing a lot of people forget is actually pickups. Right. They're hidden out the way. Are the pickups actually touching the backs of the wheels? But that's not just for DCC. Having good pickups is essential to anything that's been driven by electricity. It's just good practice. It's very good practice. Yeah. Not yeah. just good practice, very good practice. Yes. Well, any, are there any other motor control functions that modern decoders can deliver that uh, will? All the decoders these days can be tuned to suit the different types of motors. You've got the small coarse motors that have started to be fitted in, say, the N-gauge things, and one or two small double O locos, so you can tune the decoders to suit that. Uh, you can do things like start voltage, so if you've got a, an engine that's a little bit sticky, you mm -hmm. can give it a bit more of a kick to set off. Uh, there's decoders now being introduced where there's, a, where's what's called a one-step setup, where you can just put one, change one configuration variable, and it will automatically change about six others. Say, I want to drive a heavy freight, and your local will now become a heavy freight. Okay. Yeah, and you can do this online as well. You can do it with the computers. You can also do it while the train is on the track running normally. So you could run the light engine in to couple up the train, mm -hmm. press a few buttons on your handset, doing it on the track, and it now thinks it's a heavy freight and off it goes and re reacts differently. Yeah. And is it genuinely that easy to do then? It's just a, a couple of buttons or something and... and yeah, two, don't. three buttons, that's it. It really is. You don't it need really to put is. it on a programming track or anything like that? Not at all. It's a thing called programming on the main. Programming on the main, it's, it's not used by a lot of people, but it is there uh, and a lot of decoders do do it. Yes, it's very easy to do. And should you get things wrong, they've all got a decoder reset. Right. So you can just reset back to factory values and it's just like getting it out of the box then. Okay. So you can't really go wrong with them. And is there Which a standard, is a do all decoders have the same, can you reset them in the same way? Is it a, is it a standard Yes. A yeah. standard procedure to do that? The standard nowadays is CV8 equals 8. Go back a while, some of the older decoders are a bit different to that, but all the ones I've known over the last 10 or 15 years, if you do a CV8 equals 8, you'll get a factory reset. And it's just like restarting your computer basically. Okay. Yeah. So you don't just turn it off and back on again? Not quite, not right. quite the same, but you press but it's button, almost you, you actually same. keep it turned on, but yep. you just press a couple of buttons. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Good stuff. Okay, so we talked about lights and motor control with Mick. We've now been joined by Ian Bishop, better known as Biff or Lego Man Biffo, who's one of the UK's leading digital sound experts. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the Class 66, uh, the hardware that uh, is included in it and what that offers to the customer. Okay, Ian, we've got a couple of 66s in front of us. Can you talk us through what's built into this new loco, uh, the hardware, and then we'll move on to the sound functions and um, what it can deliver. 
Okay, so um, so Hattons came came approached me uh, when they were uh, developing the model uh, and and asked what what speaker I I thought would be you know would be should be used in it and um, and I had recently discovered this. Um, uh, speaker that we we refer to this as the uh, the Earth Mover um, because the the base performance is incredible um, and I I said I suggested it to them wasn't expecting them to run with it and I was pleasantly surprised that they did um, and hopefully the, uh, the the customers will will once they hear the loco they'll appreciate why we why we suggested using such a speaker um, so they've mounted it we've got a, a a chassis here and as you can see the speaker sits just there. Uh, facing down the way, so it's quite a big speaker, bigger than most uh, locos have ha have factory fitted. Uh, it's a very high quality speaker. The bass performance is incredible for the size of it. Um, and just to interrupt for a second, yeah. why is that bass important in a, in something? Well, I mean, uh, particularly in a diesel loco, uh, the, you know, they're very gutsy, bassy um, beasts, aren't they? And uh, you know, if you can reproduce that in a model, you know. The, you need that base performance, okay. Um, and obviously, coupled then with um, an ESU version five chip, the latest generation of um, chip, um, you know, we, we've been able to produce a quality sound in loco. What does the version five decoder offer on top of its pre predecessor? Okay, so um, from from a programming point of view, it's got, um, and from a hardware point of view, it's got double the amount of memory, um, so I can cram more functionality in that. I can either make the sound uh, higher quality or I can put more sound in or a combination of both. Right. Um, so I've done a bit of both with this. You know, the sounds that need to be the highest quality are the highest quality and so on. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of functionality packed into this, this, um, uh, this model as you'll see. Uh, when we when we go through the various sound functions, so it's a much more powerful tool than the than the V4 decoder. I wouldn't say much more powerful. It's it's a logical development, if okay. you like. You know, it's right. it's the next generation. Um, yeah, it's mm. not, in terms of actual sounds, it, you know, the, the sounds are no different. Right. Um, but in terms of functionality, it enables me to give the user a lot more play value at the end of the day. And that's where this 66 comes in because you're trying to replicate all the different uh, noises, all the different. Yeah lighting functions that uh, that a modern local and has. What, what we'll do is we'll go through the sound functions one by one and we'll just explain, we'll just demonstrate all of that and just show you how much is packed in there. Okay, great. Well, fire away then. Let's, okay. Uh, let's work through them. Okay. Um, so, um, what I'm doing is I'm using the laptop to control it, just purely because it's easier for me on the day to demonstrate for the video. Um, but all of this is perfectly doable with a, an ordinary DCC controller. It's, it's nothing out of the ordinary, it's, you know, it's not a special programming device or anything like that. Okay. Um, so I'm just literally using the, the laptop. So you don't need any special equipment to do this? You can no, no, the, the laptop is just pretending to be a DCC controller, that's all it's doing. Right, okay. I'm going to go through the various uh, engine functions first of all and just, just give you a quick demo of the actual um, the quality of the sound. So the first sound you're hearing here is the priming pump. Not all Class 66s have priming pumps. So one thing you can do as the user is choose whether or not to have a priming pump. Right, okay. Um, so that's just changed by one configuration variable. So it's just obviously going through the normal startup sequence now. And these are obviously all of the sounds that we saw in the promotional video um, recorded at Shrewsbury Depot. Right. Um, that, that some of the viewers will have seen already. Right, so obviously the, the loco's idling here. Every now and again, if you're sat next to a Class 66, you'll hear the compressor cut in, and you, what happens is the idle tone changes slightly. Um, right. So if I click that on, you hear the, to the actual rhythm of the idle has changed, and you can also hear the th compressor thumping away in the okay. background now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's just on a single function key. And then we'll, we'll drop it back to the normal idle. And other things that, that Class 66s do every now and again, and there's a number of reasons why they can do this, is they'll just rev up by themselves yep. uh, yeah, when they're just sat there. Yeah. Uh, again, I've included that as a separate function key so the user can choose whether or not they want the loco to do that. Okay. I approached someone who's got a, a layout with Class 66s on it and said, 
how, how do you want this functionality to work? Right, okay. So he gave me some timings and he said, right, what I'd like on the layout is if every two minutes the loco revs up for 30 seconds mm. and then drops back down to normal idle. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's not entirely prototypical, but it's what looks and sounds right on the layout. Yeah. And I felt that was a little bit more important than actual 100% accurate. Function. So it's good that you've taken into account what, how people use these things. Oh yeah, I mean the whole them. thing is geared yeah. up so that the loco is as usable to as many different railway models as possible. Whether you've got a little end-to-end -end layout, whether you've got a massive roundy roundy mm -hmm. layout, you can the, the loco will be usable. Right. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to knock off the um, the sound. Okay, so that was just a very basic demonstration of the engine sounds. What I'll do now is um, go through the functions one by one. Okay. Uh, so function two and three are your horns, uh, and it's just a simple press on, press off, right. just like a real loco. They don't latch or anything like that, because uh, right? sometimes on It's press on, horns. press off, that's okay, the way so it, it works. Right. So if I press it on, right. okay. press off, yeah, yeah. and then the same for the low tone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. That's the set of horns that we recorded on the loco at Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've also included is two other sets of horns, uh, one from a normal class 66, if you like, right. uh, and then the f some of the Freightliner locos were fitted with different okay. types of horn. Right. So I've put those on, and the user can choose which one of those sets right. of horns okay. he wants. Right. These all these different functions that uh, that the loco has, the sound functions, can they be uh, changed round and tailored to suit? So if you can remember in a p particular order or something like that, can you allocate different sound functions to different keys other than the way they are delivered? Yes. Oh yes, yes, you can remap the functions keys to suit. That's the word the, I was looking the, for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, 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 you know, if, if, if you don't like the standard mapping, yeah, if mm -hmm. you don't like the horns on two and three, you can mm -hmm. move them to four and five, okay. for example. Yeah. And then once you've done that, the, the chip remembers that and it will stay like that forever until right. you change it again. So I've, I've now selected the, uh, the second set of horns. So, so they sound similar to the first set, but mm -hmm. obviously they're not identical. So if a user's got two or three different locos then he yeah. doesn't have to have every single one sounding exactly the same right uh, that so sort of customization is brilliant when you've got a, a big fleet of locos it makes yeah makes I mean that's one of the beauties of the new the new chip is there's 10 different configuration things that you can give to the user I've given the user three different choices on this so right. you've got horns first of all hmm. you've got three sets of horns two different sets of spirax valves right and you can have a priming pump or no priming pump so that's three basic configuration setups you can give to right. the user so he can configure it to, to the loco. Just to explain in case uh, people aren't aware, the Spirax valves, uh, are they, what, what, are they, what are they? What okay, are they so like? um, what they are, the, the Spirax valves are part of the braking system uh, on the loco. Um, generally there's an air tank underneath the loco, uh, an air reservoir, and there's a gadget on the bottom that purges water out of the braking system and it basically right. spits it out onto the track every few seconds okay. uh, and it, when it does it it makes a very ca characteristic sound you know people will have heard this you know the sort of tick 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 yeah. sound when the loco is on the depot okay yeah. well I've heard two different types of Spirax valve on the 66 so I've recorded both and mm. the user can choose them. which one he wants right. um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that when we when we come okay. on to that great okay thank you um, so coming back to horns, I'm just going to select now the third set of horns. So they sound much more like a, a sort of heritage mm. loco. They're, they're quieter than the, the normal horns. Um, and I believe it's Freightliner locos they're generally fitted to, but don't quote me okay. on that. Right. Function four is basically your buffering up uh, and coupling sounds. Um, if I get the loco moving, first of all, and I'll turn the sound on. Okay, so what, what I want to imagine now is if we've got some stock over here, we're going to buffer up to the stock, first mm -hmm. of all, uh, and then couple up to it. Um, so the way it works, if I get the loco moving, as you approach the stock, you turn on function 4, and nothing happens. When you bring the loco to a standstill, 
just at the appropriate moment the sound mm -hmm. happens automatically so you've right. not got to remember to, you've not got to try and stop the loco and press the sound button okay. it yeah. does it for you all that's you've got to do is stop the loco in the right place okay that's really clever is yeah. that something that's um, new to the v5 decoder that you're no no it's something that i've programmed it? before on the okay. version 4 but right. it's, it's something that you uh, people might not be aware of mm. so it's just to demonstrate the functionality first of all that's really so good. now once you've, you've now buffered up to the stock i'll turn off turn function 4 off if you now press it again you yep. get the, the sound of the coupling going onto the hook right okay okay so right. it's all it's all yep. it's a related function if you like so i'll put it on yep. one button rather than waste two keys right, right. so you buffer up mm -hmm. then release it then couple up i like it and when you couple up if you do it the coupling up sound and the buffering sound are not the same every single time right there'll be about five or six different hook sounds okay five or diff six different buffering up sounds right and it just makes it more believable and then they're selected at random are they by it, the at way? random yeah right yeah so if i press it repeatedly mm -hmm. you get that right. just slight yeah. variation mm -hmm. um, yeah Similar functionality with, for example, the door slam. So that's on function six. Slightly mm -hmm. different each time you press it. Didn't quite close properly the second yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You've got some real good slams, mm -hmm. you've got some gentle ones. Yeah. And so on. Right. Function five, when you're stationary, it just gives you a simple brake dump or brake test. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. If the loco's moving, it's your manual brake function so it's just like the brake in a car mm -hmm. you press it to slow the loco down the way i've set it up is if you're driving along you know for example at quite high speed and then turn the throttle to zero the loco will coast for quite a long distance okay yeah, yeah. and the idea is you then use the brake button to bring the loco to a standstill just like you would in a car okay all right so, so like they're driving a real loco as well uh, yes so indeed you yeah, knock indeed. the power off and then uh, and then coast yes until you need to put the brakes on. correct yeah, yeah. okay um, so i'll get the loco moving okay so i'll coast it now and then use the brake button To bring the loco to that's a standstill. That's a much more interactive and, and involving driving process than it the is. standard way of doing things. It is, yeah. Um, and if you're going fast enough, you can brake multiple times and you get multiple brake sounds. Right. Um, the other aspect of this as well is if you've got the loco in what I call train mode, i.e. you've got a train on the back, yeah. the brake sounds are different um, okay. as they are on a real loco. Right. So you've got a loco brake and you've got a train brake and they right. don't sound the same. Okay, right. Function seven was the um, compressor that we heard earlier on. Function yep. eight is a function called drive hold. Right. So what that does is it literally locks the speed of the loco to whatever it's doing. Okay, okay. so if I press it now, obviously the loco's stationary. What it means is I can rev the loco up without going anywhere. Yep. So if you've got a big freight train on the back, mm -hmm. you can rev it right up before you start to move yeah uh, so if i do that now so this might be useful if you're starting a really big heavy coal train on a bank right you know you've got to build the amps up first yep. before you start moving okay okay when you're happy you release the lock and the loco starts to move but you can put the lock back on mm -hmm. and keep the loco moving at ah, a very okay. slow speed or you can turn it on and off and just let the speed gradually build up. So when the loco's rolling, it's, uh, you can set a constant speed almost like a cruise control on a car. Yes, yes. You've got an, o an overall sort of maximum speed, if you like, yeah. and at a sort of normal rate of acceleration, but you can almost modify that by using the drive hold. Right. Again, that's a really important and more, it's a much more involved uh, you're much more involved yeah. in the driving process. It just gives the user that bit more control and a bit more like a real loco. Yeah. Okay, so um, function nine uh, is your flange squeal. Uh, so what this does is, if you turn function nine on, 
you will get flange squeal that's appropriate to the speed that the loco is doing. Right. So if you turn it on when it's loco stationary, you won't get any flange squeal because obviously right. the wheels aren't turning. Okay. So I've turned it on now, nothing's happened. Right. When the loco starts to move, it will start to creak and groan and squeal just like yeah. a real loco would. Yeah. So if I start to move now, And obviously at higher speeds you get a much more recognisable flange squeal sound, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on curves and stuff like that. But that's great for depot layouts and yards where yeah. you get that, where the, that sound of the rails creaking and the chairs and all that sort yeah. of thing, the sleepers, yeah. is a, is, is a, it's very characteristic, a part, it's, isn't it's it? part yeah. of the, uh, the yeah. experience, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, function 10, uh, that's just a simple dispatch whistle. Obviously this is a freight loco, but you're going to need that for your rail tours and things yeah, like that. Right, so okay, um, yeah. I thought I'd yeah. put it on there. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think there's more than one of those. Right. Just slight variations. Yeah. Function 11. Um, this represents the, um, the radio electronic token block right. sounds. Right. So some of the 66s are fitted with the RETB uh, functionality for, for example, on the West Highland line. And it, it's basically, it, if you remember the sound of a modem on an old computer, right, yep, it's not dissimilar yep, to that. Yep. So the idea is the driver will request the token and it sends a little sequence. If the signal man um, grants the token to the driver, it sends a similar sequence back the way. Okay. And sometimes you can request it but not get it right. immediately. Uh, so the driver might request it more than once, for example. So again, I've built that functionality in. Okay. Right. So if we just if we request the token first of all, so that's the token request. Yeah. Okay, so you've done that a couple of times. Signal man's mm -hmm. making a cup of tea. Right. Comes yeah. back. Uh, so if I now turn the function on and leave it on, you get the full request and response. What I've done there is I've set the volume level such that if you were stood on the platform next to the loco and the driver had the cab mm. window down, that's kind of the volume level you might hear outside. Right, well it's this not is what too I was loud, going to ask, is it something quiet. you can hear from outside the loco when it's yeah. yeah, yeah, it right. is definitely. Right. Yeah. Uh, function 12 is the uh, cooling fan sounds. Yep. Um, these, these happen automatically, so I mean I, I can't really demonstrate this on a small amount of track, uh, but the idea is you turn the function on when the loco starts to move, the first thing you hear is the uh, on the side of the loco you've got the cooler group louvers. Mm. They all clatter open, right? Okay. So you get this sort yep. of clattering noise, yep. and then once they're open, then you, the cooling fans start to um, ramp up. Yep. And on a class 66, they're very loud. Right. Uh, so yeah, you'll hear them roaring away. Yeah. Um, obviously, I can't demonstrate that on, on such a small piece of. No, track. but I guess that people watching will uh, will have heard these things passing. Uh, yeah. With yeah, a, they're with very distinctive. They'll, very they'll distinctive, the sound. roaring yeah. sound that you yeah. hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Function thirteen is your sanders. Um, just a, a hissing sound as the sand's being blown under the wheels. Yeah. Function fourteen is um, what I call radar hiss. So class 66 loco is fitted with creep control. Yeah. So it's a bit like ABS on a car. Um, the loco applies power to the wheels. If the wheels start to slip, then it backs the power off and yep. puts it back on. Yeah. Now what that means is the wheel might not be turning at the same speed. If you measure the, the, the speed using the wheel rotation, mm. it's not the same as the actual speed. Okay. So what they have to do is they have a radar sensor underneath the loco pointing at the track and they use that to measure the speed oh. instead of the wheels. Okay, right. right. And next to it there's a, a blast of compressed air and it bla it's obviously because it's underneath it gets dirty and it blasts oh. dirt off the sensor. Oh, right. Right. And 
people will have heard this. It's a very distinctive sound, as you'll hear so in a minute. you might have heard it without realising what Correct, it was. Correct, yeah. yeah. And this is basically what it is. It, okay. it, and I, it, I think it's referred to as radar hiss. Right. So this is on a function key. So I'll turn the function on. On a real loco, when it starts to move, you hear one hmm. sequence. And then after that, it happens, I think it's every 45 seconds. Right. So I've programmed it to happen at the same period yeah. that it would on a real loco. Okay. So if I get the loco moving, you'll hear the first one. So that's a sequence that I'm sure people will be familiar with. Yep. Um, and like I say, if you left that function on, that would happen in another 45 seconds time, and then again and again, okay. ad infinitum. And that's on function 14. Those sort of seemingly random sounds that come out of a diesel loco um, it makes it again makes it a much more valuable experience. With yeah. it, rather than just having the, the the loco sound in the horn, if you've got all these auxiliary sounds as well, yeah, it yeah. feels more like a it, it's like just a real loco. It does, yeah, and it's it's more play value, isn't it? Yeah. It's just it just adds to the yeah. fun and the experience. Yeah. Right. Function fifteen is your um, Spyrax valves. So what I'll do, I'll turn the engine off. And we'll. So what we're hearing now is the Spyrax valves. This is the more unusual variety of them. You don't hear these ones very often. In fact, I've only ever heard these on one loco. Right. Uh, so what I did was I got a recording of it and we've programmed it in. Mm. You turn it off, it just fades down gently over a period of time. Okay, so we've got two functions here that you might want to use before you start the loco up or after you've shut it down. Right. Um, and these are two sounds that you might hear if you were you know, on depot watching the driver prepare the loco. Okay. Um, so the first one, uh, which is function 27, is your battery isolator switch. So um, there's a big clunky switch on the side of the loco that the driver op operates to connect right. the batteries okay. before he starts it up. Right. Um, and then what he'll do is he'll go inside the loco, key in, Mm. Uh, and then start up the right. uh, the loco. So if we press the button, okay. So this is your that's your battery isolator switch. Right. And then you get a delay while the driver walks inside. Yeah. And then you'll hear him key in. And then you get the familiar AWS yep. sound. Okay, so the idea is now you start the loco up. A real loco, a real class 66 will prime for quite a long time. Yep. Obviously on a model railway layout, you don't want to wait two or three minutes for your loco to warm up. So I've set that much shorter, it's 20 seconds. Okay, yep. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, what I'll do now is I'll shut the loco down. And then if I operate function 28, this is a driver taking his key out right. and then coming outside the loco and then opening the battery isolator okay. switch. Yeah. Yeah. So everything that happens on the real in the real process of uh, starting up a loco, you can do on the decoder. Yeah, yeah. And I put them on separate functions because not everyone wants to listen to every mm. single sound every single time. They might just want to jump yeah. in and drive off. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And of course, you've got the other functionality where you can, if you don't want to wait for the full startup sequence, just mm -hmm. get the loco moving first of all like this. Yeah. And then just turn F1 on. Yeah. That's and you bypass idea. all of the startup sequence. Right. Right. There's so many possibilities. You almost need to write yourself down a list of which order to do things in, really, if you if you want to do it. Um, well, the, hopefully, this, like the, the video will go some way to explaining yeah. how and why and when you can use all of these sounds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Brilliant, Ian. Well, we've gone through all these uh, sound functions that uh, this decoder offers. What does it offer in terms of lighting? Okay. So what I've tried to do is. is 
um, first of all, configure every lighting option that the, loco, the real loco's got, but also to make that as easy as possible for the user to operate, so mm. it's not horrendously complex, it's just dead easy right. um, to operate, and I'll, hopefully I'll show that um, okay. now. Great. Um, first lighting function, obviously just the normal uh, F0, yeah. uh, where you've got um, reds at one end and yeah. whites at the other, yeah. and then obviously when you change ends, those two just swap over. Okay. Okay. Everyone's so familiar with that. Most people function. are familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, right. So at the moment, the locos we've got reds on this end, as you can see. Yeah. If you imagine now we've got a train on the back, um, you just click an extra function key, which is F20, and okay. that turns off the reds off. next to the train. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. and it also changes ends automatically. So right. you don't need to remember, ah. okay, I need to turn the reds off at this end and then turn them on at that end. Okay. The chip does that for you. That's great. Right. Because uh, okay. that's are, are on some earlier locos, uh, you need to think of the, the, the red right, lights yeah. are on a separate function. That's right. So you yeah. need to think about them separately. Yeah. So, so I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. F20 turns the red lights off mm -hmm. next to the train, regardless of which end the train is. So that's train mode. Train mode. Yep. Okay. Uh, you've also got day and night time running, so if you have a look there, we've got uh, daytime running at the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, if I then press function 22, that flips to right. um, yeah. night time running. So that's moved the uh, headlight onto the, yeah. onto the it, near it, it side. It moves the headlight yeah. from one side to the other, yeah. in, in simple terms. Uh, and again, that will change ends automatically. Right. And then finally, F21 is parking mode, right. where you've got reds at both ends. Okay. Uh, and what that does is that overrides your normal headlights. So if you've got yeah. F0, if you've got daytime running on or you've got uh, nighttime running on, it will override either of those okay. and put reds at both ends. So I'm not I sure that's ever been offered on a British local before. Is I, it? Don't, I don't remember I seeing don't that. I don't before. believe so, no. no. Okay, so there's your parking mode. You've got reds at both ends. Yep, reds both ends. So it's, it's just mm -hmm. four functions that control the, all of that. Right. Right, well that's really easy to uh, to get your head around. Yeah, it's just designed to be as, as simple as possible for the yeah. user to operate. Yeah, and it makes it a much more um, authentic uh, operation really. You can you can operate just as a real thing does. Yeah. As yeah. we it, just talked about with the sound. Again, it, it's to suit all different types of train, all different types of layout, mm -hmm. uh, and, and coupled with making it as simple as possible for the user to yeah. operate. And obviously yeah. all the functionality is covered in the, in the help sheet that's on the website. Yeah. So anybody who uh, anybody who's watching who's driven a real 66 will know just what to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, finally, does uh, does this loco have cab lights as well? Yeah. So the loco is also configured with yeah. cab lights. Again, nice and simple. It's on F function 19. Um, so you click that on. Yeah. And whichever is the leading cab, the light will come on at that cab. Right. If you change ends, so they're not switched separately. The, the uh, no, it's still function 19. Yeah. So if you go in the yeah. other way mm -hmm. and you turn F19 on, yeah. you'll get right. the cab light at that end. The other thing that the cab light does is it turns off automatically when the loco starts to move. And the reason okay. for that is that drivers are not allowed to drive with the cab light on. Yeah. Um, yeah. For the same for reason. you reasons. don't drive with a map light on. Correct. When you're in your yeah. Car. yeah. So if I turn the light on, for example, now and then start to move, yeah. the light turns okay. off automatically. And then when you come to a standstill, it'll come back on. And the sound decoder even gives you the uh, the noise of the switch. It does, well. and that is the click of mm -hmm. a real mm -hmm. Class 66 cab right. light switch. Right. That. And you mm -hmm. notice the on and off are not mm. the same sound either. Right, right, yeah. Great. Thanks, Ian. That's wonderful. There's uh, lots, to, uh, lots to enjoy. There's, there. a, there's a lot packed into it. Yeah. There's a lot packed into it. Great. I look forward to driving one myself. Thanks to Ian and Mick for talking us through all the lighting, sound and motor functions on this new Hattons Class 66. If you like what you've seen, click on the link below to order yours. And if you want to see more Hattons content, like and subscribe.